you. Um, good evening and welcome to the seventh uh, session of the Global Social Business Summit. I hope you've enjoyed this um, break so far and, I, and that you are re-energized uh, for the next session. Um, for the next session, I would like, uh, which is titled How Social Entrepreneurs Can Transform Companies into a Force for Good. Uh, the so session is organized by the social uh, in a social business. And I would like to invite Lisa Gugun most uh, senior director of UNO Social Business to um, go on with the session. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Lamia. And welcome everybody to the Unusual Pioneer session at Global Social Business Summit 2021. My name is Lisa. I'm a part of UNO Social Business and I'm honored to be hosting this session about social entrepreneurship for you all today. Today, we want to take you on a journey into a world in which big economic players have seized the opportunity to bring about positive social and environmental change. We will speak with those that, against all odds, have taken up on this challenge and are transforming their organizations into a force for good. Those amazing role models are Gisela Sanchez and Godwin Bamsa, who we will both welcome on stage in just a minute. But before we start, let me welcome a very special guest on stage with us today. He was and is an inspiration to our work with Anyoja Pioneers. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Mohamed Yunus. Please join us on stage for hello to the audience. Yes, hello to everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our session. It's a sensational session. Let's find out how we can all become entrepreneurs, unusual entrepreneurs. Welcome and let's begin. Thank you very much, Professor Yunus. Before we jump into the session, a bit of a housekeeping maybe. Um, please everyone mute your mics if you're not speaking. Please write your questions to our amazing speakers in the chat. I'm sure there's gonna be plenty and please catch up with us after the session at any time we will be sharing our contact details if you like. Now, what if we lived in a world in which not only politics, science and the social sector work towards a better future for people and planet, what if all corporates took up on their responsibility and leveraged their own resources to bring about change? Research shows that out of all companies that have made climate and social commitments, less than 25% are actually on track with meeting those goals. And less than 1% have put things to action and created actual tangible KPI for their GHG emissions. Knowing this, it won't be a surprise that also only 7% of global top executives are actually ESG and climate competent. At the same time, we know that up to 87% of employees in corporates across the world are disengaged at work. The war of talent has increased and with COVID, the digital divide has increased significantly. Disengagement rates in a home office economy have increased by a lot only in 2021. Both knowing that companies neither meet their ambitious social and environmental goals nor succeed to engage their workforce shows that things need to change rapidly. From paper-based commitments to action, from regulations and bans to innovation, we believe that social entrepreneurship can be a key to turning our economy into a force for good. So today we want to invite two unusual pioneers, social entrepreneurs that have taken up on that challenge on our stage and discuss what they have done to turn around their organizations. But before we kick off, what is social entrepreneurship exactly? Social entrepreneurs are entrepreneurial employees who combine an innovation-driven mindset and eagerness to drive market-based innovation that is dedicated to serve people and planet. As easy as that, but also as complicated as that. Because based on a global research conducted in 2019, by Unisocial Business and a number of wonderful partners. 
we have found that among social entrepreneurs and executives from around the globe, there's actually a number of factors that can help leverage social entrepreneurship and social innovation, but also hold social innovation back in companies. Many social entrepreneurs actually feel left out inside their own organizations and beyond. They lack input from peers and they lack role models. Entrepreneurs are large, are part of just give me one second. You can now see my presentation again. The research has shown that entrepreneurs uh, feel left out very often in their organizations and beyond. They lack input from peers and role models and entrepreneurs um, are a part of large scale organizations that are mostly driven by revenue creation and by excellence. So to be successful as an entrepreneur, you need to acquire important skills, not only in business design, but also in social innovation and in impact measurement. Social entrepreneurship also still is fairly new. Many employees don't know that such roles are even an option and don't know who to work with outside their um, regular contexts. Executive buy-in, lastly, has shown as an important factor to leverage entrepreneurship. So with unusual pioneers, we offer a platform to learn from peers. We offer hands-on incubation and acceleration support for social entrepreneurs. And we offer access to a community of partners that is essential to the success of social entrepreneurs. Also, we invite next to our social entrepreneurs, their executives on board of the platform to discuss future formats for her to drive social innovation. And we're not on this mission alone, but we are very, very uh, thankful to have teamed up with a number of 14 amazing global sector partners who contribute to this very mission. And today I just wanna uh, shout out a huge kudos to all of our amazing partners for making this happen with us. In 2021, we have started working on our platform with a number of global organizations and their entrepreneurs, and two of them you will meet today. The formats that we use on our platform to have entrepreneurs succeed is, first of all, formats to seed entrepreneurship in corporates. With the unusual Spark Camp, we help organizations plant a seed for social entrepreneurship by helping them create innovative ideas around their SDG commitments. And in the Unusual Pioneers Accelerator, we invite entrepreneurs to attend a six month growth journey to scale their work and engage their executives. Now, those are the faces of our whole 2021 Unusual Pioneers cohort, all of them role models in vision and passion, and all of them real change makers. They come from 15 organizations, together have reached over 80 million beneficiaries worldwide and gained significant traction with their business models, and there's quite some to learn from them. And I now want to invite very warmly two of our Unusual Pioneers fellows on stage, my two guests are both very successful social entrepreneurs that can tell us more about what it is like to be a change leader inside a multinational corporate. And I am honored and excited to welcome on stage with us Gisela Sanchez, Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at BAC LATAM and Godwin Bamsa, External Affairs and Sustainable Business Lead at Unilever in Nigeria. Welcome on stage to the both of you. Maybe Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, I'm happy to everyone. Maybe before we kick off, a few words um, about um, the two of you. Gisela, you have just recently joined BASC Latam before you were Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at FIFCO where you very successfully created and scaled NutriVida, a social business committed to eradicate undernutrition in the world by selling highly nutritious food products at an affordable price. Gisela, you're a trained industrial engineer and you're a fellow of the Central American Leadership Initiative. You have received the Stefan schmidt Haney Innovation on Sustainability Award and you're um, a laureate of the John McNulty Prize. You're a board member in several NGOs and you were named as part of the 50 most influential women in Central America by the Forbes magazine twice. 
Very warm welcome to you, Gisela. Thanks so much for spending your Sunday with us. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this kind invitation. Very excited to talk to you and Godwin, who I admired a lot about social entrepreneurship and about social business. Thank you very much. Now, our second guest, Godwin, leads External Affairs and Sustainability at Unilever Nigeria and Ghana. In your role, Godwin, you manage partnerships, industry, government, regulatory, and community relations. At Unilever, you have helped design and implement programs that helped families access nutritious breakfasts, that helped women prevent iron deficiency, create financial inclusion, recycle plastic, and provide dermatological care. Among many other initiatives, Godwin, um, you lead the Shakti program, a program that creates livelihoods and an inclusive society by providing business training and funding to women in rural areas. Godwin, you hold a degree in nutrition, and I think here we have a great connection point to Gisela's work as well. You're a Acumen yeah. Fellow, and together with Gisela, you joined our 2021 cohort in Unusual Pioneers. Thank you so much also to you for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you for this platform. And yes, uh, it's great to be an Unusual Pioneer Fellow. It's been a fantastic um, a period with a fantastic cohort. And yes, I'm glad to be here to be able to share uh, one or two things from, from that experience and from the work we do at Unilever. Thank you. And Gisela, really great to share this platform with you. Thank you. Now, this year's Global Social Business Summit is all about creating a new economy. Gisela, from your perspective as a social entrepreneur, why is now the time to seed the plant and what do companies need to do from your perspective? Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, well, the new economy is such an important question. Um, I strongly believe that the amount and the size of the challenges that we are facing, social and environmental in the world, cannot wait more and it's impossible to think uh, from a private sector perspective that the government, the governments of our, of our world are gonna solve all of these challenges by themselves. So it's the, it's the time for everyone to join uh, and, and be part of the solution to these social and environmental challenges. Companies have a lot of, uh, of things to add, their con core competencies, their talent, uh, their know-how, of course, capital sometimes to, to uh, accompany the government and the civil society to solve this problem. So it's, um, I strongly believe it's the time to remove barriers from the different sectors of society and for companies to understand that they, they need to have a higher purpose as a, as a business. It's not a matter of mass maximizing profits anymore. Uh, we, we know that this is an outdated model that doesn't make any sense in the 21st century, and, and especially when we see all of the challenges that we're facing. And I strongly believe that when companies commit to specific targets, specific KPIs, specific goals, social and environmental, they can be um, a force for good and, and actually move a lot of resources, capital resources, know-how, talent, a lot of things to, to make this, this uh, world a better, a better place for everyone. And it will be, as Stefan schmidt Heine once said, it will be impossible to imagine that companies can be successful in failed societies. It's totally impossible. So we have to join forces. It's the time to move and expand the, the definition of success that we normally have in the business environment to incorporate not only creating economic value or maximizing economic value for shareholders, but incorporate the social and the environmental value that we have to create and share with all our stakeholders. And that's the challenge that we are facing right now and the opportunity for the entrepreneurship um, to move along and accelerate change, positive change in the world. Thank you very much, Gisela. Godwin, Gisela just said, it is time for all of us to join in. Why did you join in? Why did you become a social entrepreneur? Well, um, 
So honestly, Lisa, I wish I could you know, give you some grand theory <clears throat> about how I discovered social entrepreneurship, but the truth is social entrepreneurship discovered me. Um, I joined Unilever and I joined as a nutritionist and as a public health nutritionist, we work in a space similar to social entrepreneurship, right? Um, so as soon as I got into Unilever and I saw all the opportunities, um, I began to work there even before I knew what social entrepreneurship meant. Uh, I was lucky because um, Unilever is a company that, you know, for the last decade has been thriving on purpose, right? Trying to make social impact, make environmental impact, as well as uh, business impact. Um, and so the, the, the foundation for, for social entrepreneurs to arise out of the company already existed. And I was lucky in that respect. Um, however, it is also instructive in how we get others to, to become social into entrepreneurs as well. Uh, and that is, we need to get organizations to become that petri dish uh, for creating social entrepreneurs. Um, one way analogy I like to use and that I like to describe to people is social entrepreneurship is the new R&D, right? It's, it's social R&D. You need people to expect, you need the business to experiment, you need to test things with consumers. And honestly, the things that consumers care about are the things that affect them personally. So there's, there's the social issues they deal with, the environmental issues they deal with, all of these are personal to them. And social entrepreneurs are the new R&D who go out and run those experiments and bring them back into the business and translate them into business ideas and business solutions. And the second thing is you need to realize that this purpose and the social impact work multiplies ROI for the business, right? Um, entrepreneurs are not about um, going out and, and you know, doing pro bono work. You know, we want to figure out how the business grows by doing this and how society grows by doing it. So it really multiplies the ROI for the business. Um, and you, know, you talked earlier about how it becomes a differentiator for the organization and, and for uh, em, I mean, attracting talent and all of that. It is important when um, employees and those who want to join your company see that this is a platform for me to come and realize my purpose, or at least test out my purpose and see if that is actually who I want to be or what I want to be. Um, organizations who, who make themselves into that platform um, really enhance that. And so while I was lucky that Unilever provided me a platform to become a social entrepreneur, uh, the scalable model is to get in, um, organizations to, to provide platform for everyone, all the employees, to become social entrepreneurs if they want to. And the, the return on ROI is significant if we can figure it out. Thank you very much, Godwin. Speaking about social R&D, Gisela, your company, Nutrivida, that you founded out of FIFCO was a very special social R&D project, uh, beginning actually with your own personal experience. Can you tell us a little bit more about Nutrivida, what made you start it, and where you got with the idea? Absolutely. Um, this idea was started in my mind and in my heart, I will say, around eight years ago, eight to nine, and, and it was because I came um, uh, in front of a paper actually wrote by Professor Yunus about the social business concept. And at that time, at that specific time, I was thinking about my, my own purpose in life. And um, I, I think normally when you're too young, and I can imagine a lot of people in the audience are very young, you always think about yourself, your self-development, your career, Uh, the goals that you have, the ambitions. And, uh, and, and people say that um, until you are 60 years old, normally you don't think about purpose and legacy. So the, the first uh, lesson that I, I want to share is that we have to start thinking about what is our own purpose in life as soon as possible. In my case, when I started thinking about purpose and, and, and where is this sweet spot between what I really care about and the world's deep hunger, um, I, I came quickly, quickly to the conclusion that it was nutrition. I grew up in a very, very poor family. Both my families are very poor. 
And I actually experienced undernutrition myself. Undernutrition uh, basically means the lack of micronutrients. My mother is, I guess, the best mother ever. Uh, but she was uh, giving me, when I was a, a, a child, condensed milk with water because uh, she said it was nice, tastes good, cheap, convenient. And, uh, and of course, we know that it was not the right thing to, to eat for me. Uh, but thank God I'm here. And um, so when I thought about the purpose, I immediately thought, what can I do to provide food? And especially to provide food to children. And one way was to get out of the, of the business sector and become an entrepreneur. Uh, the other one, and I didn't know the name of the word entrepreneur at that time, but to use the forces of my, our, my, my own company to solve this problem. So I started convincing the board of directors and the CEO to develop NutriVida and uh, convince them for me to go to Bangladesh at that time, I will say with the luck that I was the only from America, the American continent, nobody from the US at that time, nobody from Latin America. So everybody was looking at me like, this is an interesting person from the other part of the world. And I started chasing Professor Yunus around the world to convince him to join us to create NutriVida because I strongly believe nutrition is the most important thing, along with education, of course, uh, but before you can educate a child, you need to provide the right nutrition for this, this, uh, this child. Gisela, I think. To be able to develop to their model how to develop the products and be able to, uh, to create a NutriVida. And, and now we have been able to positively a little bit more than 3 million people in our region. So it, it makes sense at the end. Thank you so, so much, Gisela. Just a quick heads up. I think your connection is a little unstable. So if you have a chance to reconnect to maybe another Wi-Fi, that, that would be good. Um, until we have that figured out, thank you so much for this wonderful introduction and to really um, an insight to your, your um, absolute success story. Godwin, listening to Gisela, what was it that made you actually decide that you want to pick up um, and, and uh, turn your organization into a force for good? Um, what is it that drives your projects and what makes you successful as a social entrepreneur within Unilever? Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, I mean, every time Gisela talks about her work, um, it just cuts straight to my heart being a, a nutritionist. Um, and especially coming from a third world country um, where I think I once told someone, listen, I come from that area of the world where the statistics you talk about is our lived experiences. Uh, those numbers are us, they're me, they're people. I can name, I can put names behind those numbers, you know? So when, when Gisela talks about these things, it, it really cuts deep, man, and I really appreciate the, the work that she does. Um, that being said, let, let me talk about Unilever a bit. In 2010, we started this experiment um, that a lot of people thought was, was crazy, you know? Why leave? the business of doing business to chase all this uh, funny stuff like, like helping poor people. Uh, how, how does that even make sense? Um, so we started something called the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan we, uh, by Paul Bowman, the then CEO, and we said we wanted to make sustainable living commonplace. Um, we approached it very differently from what's obtained in 2010. Um, all our targets and metrics, everything was made public. We were tracking it publicly. You could see what we're doing. Uh, we had particular areas that we thought we had the might to, to make impact. And we started that experiment. And a decade later, we've been able to prove that the brands that we have, we, we have hundreds of brands, those ones that decided to identify a social or environmental issue and make it the, the identity of the brand, um, they grew way beyond the, the other brands in, in, the, in the portfolio. Um, we were able to attract talent, you know, um, we were able to 
push other organizations into this space, um, create lots of, of conversations. And so after a decade of that experiment, we are progressing forward with something called Compass. Simpler, it, in, it, it, it integrates purpose into everything that we do. Um, the, the brand marketing, the brand sales, um, our R&D, our um, supply chains, everything, you know, we bring purpose into it, you know. And that is what we have been doing. So we have quite a few initiatives and a few programs, but I'll talk about Shakti, uh, which is why we're here. With Shakti, what we do is we go into rural areas, we identify rural women, um, we train them, and then we provide them with a basket of good on loan. Um, and they begin to sell and they pay off that loan, make savings, they become really entrepreneur, and then they grow their business and they become a part of our value chain. So they begin to contribute to our business, but also they begin to, to grow their own uh, capacity. They're able to find livelihoods um, and grow their business. And I tell people that of all the programs we have, this is one that is particularly close to my heart because it goes for the core of the issue that people face. And that sometimes is hard to find, right? Um, sometimes we see a problem and we think, oh, this problem is important. It is important, but it is not exactly important to the beneficiaries at that point in time. So you might do it and find you're struggling, but with this, it just drives itself. The women perpetuate it, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's really strong. And then it also answers the question of fitting into our business and contributing to our business growth. So the sustainability is there, you know, all, all the, the boxes are ticked. So apart from the fact that it addresses root issues of livelihood for these women and their families, and they're able to become contributing members of their communities, it gets them to the point where they can even become aspirational, which is what, where we want them to get to. You know, they can now uh, take on bigger dreams. Um, one of the women was saying in a video we made that she wants to build her house. And before we finished making the video, she had started building her house. And, you know, and this was a woman who didn't have a job to start with. And that is a fantastic story. Um, so what we have been able to do beyond the success of creating livelihoods and, and contributing to our business is we put the steering wheel back in the hands of these beneficiaries, right? We are not treating them as... Um, uh, you know, people you, you give something to. We're treating them as partners. They're contributing to our business. We hold them accountable for their, when their business doesn't do well, we hold their hands, you know, they are now our business partners and they hold us accountable as well, um, rather than just beneficiaries of our benevolence. Um, and they help us grow our bottom line and create a sustainable model for us. Um, so these are the type of solutions we're trying to create, right? Um, we have lots of them. Some of them are really great. Uh, you would know of the Dove uh, self-esteem program for girls and life boy hand washing, you know, some of these ones. And then we have some other smaller ones who keep experimenting and just haven't found that fit. And we continue to push them that, you know, the brands have to find their fit, the functions, the supply chains, all of them have to find um, that purpose and how we make sustainable living commonplace and just multiply value all around, both for the business and for the communities that we serve. Thank you very much, Godwin. Uh, tremendous work done. So many very interesting projects. Thank you very much for highlighting specifically the Shakti program. You named a number of initiatives. Um, what I would love to understand is how many of them were started by your fellow employees inside Unilever? How many of them are rather executive driven initiatives? And with that, how can you um, actually expand on the point of talent attraction that you mentioned before? How can you take your journey uh, together with your colleagues or how can you even um, have your colleagues interested in joining the same tracks? Maybe Godwin and I would also love to hear from you, Gisela. Well, uh, Lisa, I'm not sure which ones were started by um, employees or which one were started by business leaders, but, you know, a lot of times it doesn't quite matter. Um, sometimes, you know, there are frameworks that brands use to, to identify what they do. Um, other times it comes, to, it comes to you. So I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of dermatologists had gone to uh, one of the war-torn countries, you know, and they were providing care. 
And then when they had returned, they had published uh, an op-ed. And in that op-ed, they had said one of the regrets they had was that they did not have more petroleum jelly uh, on that trip. And an employee had picked it up. And we are one of the biggest makers of petroleum jelly, Vaseline. Uh, and so we reached out to them. And before you knew what was going on, um, the Vaseline Healing Project was born. So in, in, in partnership with other organizations. And what we decided to do was you know, identify where could we make the most impact. Uh, dermatologists aren't enough for the amount of dermatological cases that need to be treated. So we began to offer training to healthcare practitioners to, to offer basic dermatological care and multiply the number of dermatologists who can work in that sense. Uh, and then we had outreaches where we go to areas where we know that dermatological issues will be quite significant and then we'll provide care and then we'll provide Vaseline petroleum jelly in abundance to wherever it needs to be used. Um, and that was how Vaseline discovered, you know, its purpose work that it was supposed to do. Um, sometimes we also use frameworks where we sit down and look at the data and look at where the issues are and decide, yes, we want to take on this. So sometimes, you know, it comes to us in, in different ways. Um, early in my career at Unilever, we did an experiment with the Lagos State Government where we wanted to train um, nurses in primary health care to provide nutrition um, education to, to mothers. Um, it was quite difficult, but it was quite fulfilling. Um, it didn't quite take off, you know, because, you know, you had teaching problems and we had to figure things out. But that experimentation and that, you know, that's the whole purpose of R&D. Um, those in the medical sciences will understand it the most. You put so much money in R&D and you lose so much money in R&D, but then you find that one project that just works. And, you know, that is the way I think we need to uh, uh, approach social entrepreneurship that, because it is going to be a lot of experiments, a lot of them are going to fail, uh, but that is okay. And you build your muscle, you build your capacity um, in doing that. Now I've been in Unilever for quite a few years and every time HR is talking about, what do we do to keep employees in the business? I tell them, maybe you shouldn't be talking to me. I'm way too um, busy trying to look for things to solve within the business. Maybe you should go talk to others who are not social entrepreneurs and maybe I can help you with that at some point, you know? So yes, talent retention, it really helps with talent retention. Um, it's also really helps with talent attraction. You know, I, I, I know how many um, previous colleagues or, or schoolmates have reached out to me to say, look, we see all the things you do and we just want to come to Unilever. And I say, you know, that's a great idea. And if there's an opportunity, I'd love for you to come. So uh, as organizations, we have to figure out how to just create this immense value for our employees and just unleash them upon the problems in society and just see how much returns come back to the business and to society. Through. Thank you so much, Godwin. And maybe also to you, Gisela, how did you take your colleagues on your inspiring journey? I think the key and what has been the key for FIFCO is that um, 13 years ago, uh, the company decided to merge their sustainability um, strategy with their corporate strategy uh, to become a triple bottom line company. And that meant uh, to create not only objectives for the economic dimension, but incorporating with the same excellence, with the same rigorosity, um, social and environmental objectives for all the employees. And actually the compensation, 60% of the compensation of, of the CEO down is based on economic indicators, but the other 40 is based on social and environmental. So that meant that every single employee has the opportunity, uh, the license, I will say the permission to be an entrepreneur and try to solve social and environmental problems as part of their jobs. It's not something that you do on the side, uh, because you're a really good person and on Sundays and Saturdays you, you're trying to solve this but because it's part of the compensation and it's part of the strategy it's 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 part of the DNA so the the main recommendation that I, I and, and lesson learned I will say is to make it part of the DNA and DNA means strategy and DNA means compensation financial compensation of the employees so 
Uh, that has been an amazingly important uh, within FIFCO because um, sometimes employees will say, we know that we have a footprint related to PET, so they are trying to make solutions for that. Or we know that we um, that, that FIFCO is a, is a beverages company, so water is really key to their products, and, and it's important to be not only water neutral, but water positive and to become a, a force of good for water in the world. So I think it's, it has been the main force. And, and I, I hate to say that compensation has been key to align the messages. It's not about putting posts and, and, uh, and sending emails. It's about like walking the talk and saying, this is important for our company. We're gonna compensate you to develop social solutions and environmental solutions to the main challenges of the world. And, and, and I, I guess in our case, it has been the key and it's in our, in my new company back, the same thing. I, I strongly believe it's, you incorporate social business, social entrepreneurship into your own DNA and, and strategy, it's gonna move on quickly. Yeah, I, I think Lisa, if, if you don't mind me jumping in there, I think Gisela makes a really important point, right? What organizations incentivize is where you will see the work happen, right? And if you incentivize just the economic results and that's really where people will focus, right? And you would find that um, employees begin to ask themselves, is this what my time? Is this a pet project? Does my, do my superior see it as a pet project? You know, things like that. Um, but when you begin to incentivize um, social impact, you begin to in incentivize ESG, you will see results in, in social impact and ESG, like, like Gisela says. You know, you tie it back to compensation, you, you, you tie it back to, to promotions, um, you give visibility to those who do this work. It attracts other people, you know, and then before you know anything, you have a bit of an army. Um, doing this work. So absolutely I agree with Gisela on that point. Um, I just thought to add. Thank you both very, very much. As I hear it, you both see a bright future actually for corporate organizations uh, for turning strategic commitments into actual actions. But maybe looking deeper into your journeys as social entrepreneurs, we know, we all know that at times social entrepreneurship can be challenging. And we would love to hear a little bit about maybe what, what keeps you up at night or what kept you up at night. Which were the moments that you might have even questioned the role of being a social entrepreneur, Gisela, and what did you do um, to overcome this? Thank you, Lisa. Um, it makes me laugh, but, but a little bit of cry too. It has been quite a difficult journey. It's nice to be here and say we have been having social impact, but it has been very, very difficult. We faced a lot of competition, a lot from regular companies that don't understand that social businesses are gonna be part of the ecosystem now. And, uh, and they don't like that because we come with a very powerful uh, purpose and at the same with a very powerful, I will say business proposition, value proposition. So it's not easy for regular companies to understand that. And in the case of Nutrivida, we have been facing a lot of competition from, from regular companies in, in our markets. And, um, and it, it, kept me, it kept me out, of, out at night every single day to think um, that we have to keep going because the higher purpose of Nutrivida is bigger than us and it's more important than all the challenges that we have been facing. Of course, it's difficult for a social business to get to the break even because the prices are really, really small. And with small prices, small profits, small margins, and of course, no profit. So it's a, it's a very thin line. And when you have to, to sell your products, uh, the other thing that has been a, a very important lesson learned is that people in the bottom of the pyramid, even the poorest of the poor, like aspirational projects. They don't consider themselves poor people. They don't want to have uh, things that are made for poor people. They want to have the best quality possible, aspirational packaging, the best ingredients inside. So it has been quite a journey for us to learn 
that we have to, to be as, as efficient as possible, but at the same time, use all the forces of the regular companies to be a social business. Uh, and and uh, the other thing is that we still have 2 billion people who suffer from undernutrition in the world. So the way ahead is, uh, is, is pretty long, but at the same time, I strongly believe that especially after the pandemic, companies have been realizing that it's impossible to turn around and say, this is not my problem. This is the problem of the, of the government. This is not my issue. Everybody has to be involved. So um, the, the good thing is that when you have something clear in your mind, you have a clear vision and it's aligned to your most deep values as a human being, you have the energy to keep going. Even though people will say it's not a good idea, you have so many other things to do. Uh, there are so many other things going on in the company. You keep going because you know that is the way for you to add value to the world. And, and we are not plants. We don't come here like to, to live and reproduce and die. We're supposed to be here to do something else. And, and when you find that purpose and you, you, you know, in my case, I know that my personal background was here for a reason. I experienced myself under nutrition because I had to do something after. Uh, so it's, a, it's something that is stronger than me. I cannot say I don't remember any more about this. It's part of my DNA as a human being. And, um, and it kept me with the energy and the, with the conviction to convince others to join and, and to talk to other companies, because I think it's the right way to do business. It's the right way to do capitalism. It's the right way to define, as Professor Yunus has been saying very wisely for the last years, is the right thing to approach life and, and business. So it's a, it's a power that is, I, I will say, in, and I strongly believe is the same with Godwin because I can see it in, in his eyes. It's an energy that is beyond us. Thank God <laughs> is stronger than us and keep us moving alone, even though we have been facing so many challenges that I will bore you to, to tell you about that. We have been almost broken and, and ready to, to close the social business many times in these eight years. But uh, all of a sudden things align and because it's a stronger purpose, people join, people help and it, it moves and it moves and it moves. So, so it's, a, it's quite a journey. Uh, don't get disappointed if you are thinking about creating a social business. It's an amazing thing. And it's like having a, ch a, a children, but it's like having a child, something that will go beyond you. Thank you so much. Gisela, you have recently transitioned into your exciting new role. Which learnings uh, that you just mentioned, you mentioned many, are the ones that you are taking up on straight away? Um, and what would be your recommendations to other entrepreneurs? And then Godwin would also love to hear about your recommendations. I will, my first recommendation, I will have um, three. My first one is think about your purpose. Even though we don't have the answer right away, or even maybe I don't have the, the, the final answer because it can change along, along the, the years, we have to keep asking the question, what is my purpose and the purpose of our company? If you are uh, in a company, what is the thing that we can do to be part of the solution? Hopefully this, uh, this purpose and this initiative will be close to the core business of your company. That will make a lot of sense. Uh, because if, for example, I now I work for a bank. It's actually the leading bank in Central America. So now I have the opportunity to catalyze a lot of social mm -hmm. change in different industries in the region. And so I keep going, coming to this question. So now that I can provide financial solutions, for example, what are the social and main social and environmental challenges that I can push um, to, to solve? And the third one I will say is don't think, if you are a business person, don't think as a business person. Don't think as an entrepreneur, even though you are. Think as an entrepreneur, because when you are inside a company that has a lot of resources, you don't have, if you have the corporate hat, you will not be easily successful. It's better to think that you have very limited resources as a regular entrepreneur has and grow organically. 
And even though you can have a really wild ambition and bold ambition, make it very concrete and modest in the beginning. And, and let me tell you, I remember I went to Bangladesh and saw that, for example, Gramin Danone, for Gramin Danone, it took seven years to be, become, uh, to, to get to the break even. And I thought that I will be able to do it in less time. So I said, no, three to four years. Run, 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 run. It's difficult. It's difficult with these low margins uh, to be successful so quickly. So we have to be, to think about the, the reaction that the competition will have and think about growing organically. And the most important, I will say, keep it close to your heart. Like do something that is really close to your heart, a social problem or a social or environmental challenge that is something that you feel really connected to because that is special energy that is, is related to your own purpose, not only the purpose of the company, will give you the energy to be successful. Thank you very, very much. And Godwin, if you were to start being an entrepreneur today, what would you do? And what would you recommend to all those that will hopefully soon be entrepreneurs? Um, so Lisa, if, if, if I had to start my journey out today, um, let, let me use a sport analogy. Um, I play basketball and, you know, a lot of times you see LeBron and you see Steph Curry and, and you don't remember the names of the other guys on the team. And you just sometimes have to sit back and realize if you put only this guy on the team against another team, he will lose without a doubt. Right. Um, as a social entrepreneur, I am one person. I have done a few good work but I'm still one person. There's only so far I can run. It's a big field. It's a big set of problems. There's only so much I can do. Same with Gisela, right? If I had to start all over again, honestly, I would channel my energy into creating an army of social entrepreneurs um, than just running off doing stuff by myself. You know, what you can do by creating an army of social entrepreneurs, which is pretty much what Unusual Pioneers is trying to do, which is pretty much the essence of this conversation. Um, it's much more than what we can do individually, you know, and creating the army of entrepreneurs does not stop you from doing what you're doing, but it multiplies by your, the, the impact you can make by several degrees. I was trained as a nutritionist and, you know, I have diversified and be able to take up other projects, but imagine those who were trained as engineers and those who have MBAs and those who have a soci social sociology background and stuff. They would see things differently and you know imagine all we could have done if we were all pulling in the same direction as social entrepreneurs so if i had to start that is where i would start and now that being said what should other organizations do i think if organizations do not begin to realize that social entrepreneurship creates a social r d for them it creates social listening you know, to, to, to the consumers they hope to serve. Um, there's opportunity being lost. There's, there's money being left under the table um, if we do not take all of this into account. So we really, as organizations, have to begin to invest in this. Um, I, I had a conversation with someone and they asked me, okay, look, Unilever is different. You know, you have CEOs at the top who, who push this and, and, and who inspire this. Um, for CEOs who just want to start, I, I said, look, just set a challenge. Tell the organization, this is one huge challenge. We want to be the company that solves it and see what happens. You'd be surprised the immense potential that sits within your organization. You know, people will start to have conversations. People will start to think. They will come up with crazy, weird ideas that you cannot use, but that is how they will start their journey and their growth. On their own, even before you begin to look for the resources and the empowerment for them, they would begin to look out for it themselves. They would discover usual pioneers themselves. They would discover unisocial business because there's no way you go through the social entrepreneurship journey and you won't come across these organizations. You know what I mean? Uh, League of Entrepreneurs, et cetera, et cetera. Just set huge goals for them um, beyond the economic goals and they will begin to look for it and then just go over and above and support them provide resources, provide funding, 
put your money where that challenge is, you know, and, you know, you would grow these guys and honestly, we'll be able to create um, business models and, and, and new businesses that, you know, in addition to what Nutrivida or Unilever is doing that, that we would be talking about on platforms such as this. Thank you very, very much, Godwin, for your advice and your insights. Now we have another seven or so minutes to answer questions from the audience. And I've already received a very interesting one, um, which is, do you see any limitations for social entrepreneurship? Gisela, this one went directly to you. What is it that social entrepreneurship cannot do, maybe? It's yeah, difficult for me to see limits to social entrepreneurship because it's, um, it's a, new, a new way of doing business. Uh, it's a new way for me to create a competitive advantage. So, um, of course, the only thing that will be a little bit more difficult for entrepreneurship to do is um, to maximize only the profits for the shareholders. Uh, if you want to go with an own mentality, entrepreneurship would not work because the base and the heart of entrepreneurship and the, I will say the unusual pioneers program is to be unusual and find solutions to the key challenges. And, and those challenges have to go beyond maximizing profits for shareholders. So that's the only limit that I see. Other than that, I will, I will say the definition of employee that we had 30 years ago, when you are supposed to do certain things The, like follow certain rules doesn't apply anymore. Uh, entrepreneurship has a lot of potential. It's like the best uh, combination of wanting to solve social problems as a regular entrepreneur when you want to, to create an NGO, but at the same time have all of these resources available in the private sector, in the business sector to solve it. So it's like being in the best of the two worlds. You don't have to, to leave a company to be an, an entrepreneur anymore. You can do it within your own company. And that's for me, the most powerful thing. It's a beautiful combination. It's like, I admire the social business concept so much because it was designed in a very simple way, but using the best of the two worlds, the best of the civil society, the best of the private sector combined, And that is exactly what entrepreneurship is, an opportunity to solve problems and you do it without having to sacrifice or say no to your other life, which is be part of a company, be, be motivated to, to be part of it and, and do things. And, and we know, we definitely know that capitalism has been the most successful way Uh, to improve the, the conditions of the world. So we have to work along those lines, but do it in the best way possible. And entrepreneurship give you that freedom to do it inside. And that's why uh, we were telling Godwin and I that if you, as a leader of a company, define um, objectives, not only economic ones, but social and environmental, you give your employees the freedom to be an entrepreneur. It's not a matter of only creating an entrepreneur uh, training program and say, we want to have you as an entrepreneur. It's about aligning the objectives, the strategic objectives of the company to do that. Thank you very, very much, Gisela. Connecting to your answer, we've had another very interesting question uh, from someone who's a graduate and is actually looking for a social impact driven role and was asking, what do I look out for in a company if I'm searching for an intrapreneurship role? How do I find out whether a company is on the right track? Godwin, what would you say? Mm, okay, so <laughs> Lisa, I think given my background, um, what I'd say is, you know, the two answers I'd give. <clears throat> the first is, sometimes it's difficult to tell um some companies you know you, you go on their website and they tout all these things and then you go in and they just are, are at a different stage in their journey um it just might be that they have had an economic slump 
and everybody is trying to pull the business out of the stump and nobody's paying too much attention. Um, you might get in and think, oh, they lied to me. No, 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 nobody lied to you. Um, it's just everybody's in different stages of their journey. And then some people are just way advanced in this journey. You know, you go to Nitrogida, they, they understand this concept. They're way advanced in this journey. Unilever is way advanced in, in this journey and some other companies. But I think the important thing is to ask yourself, what is my purpose? And then how do I marry that to the work that I do to seek for opportunities or extra opportunities, both for my business and for society? And how do I create value out of it? Now, if you've never had experience with it, it's not as simple as it sounds. Creating um, economic profit for the business is hard enough. Solving social issues is hard enough. When you mix the two, it's not going to be a picnic. And you need to be ready for that, you know? And then that is the mindset you approach it with. Even if you go into an organization that already has um, um, all of these laid down and, you know, it's possible, it does not mean the problem you're going to take on is going to be easier to solve because of that. These are really difficult problems that most of the world is trying to solve. So I think it's, for me, I'd say, and I mean, somebody may have a different opinion, but for me, I'd say it's less about the company um, there's, there's a place a company plays, but it's also about yourself, the purpose that you have and the kind of value you're trying to create, right? If you think it is a big problem that you feel capable of taking on and you, are in, you have the heart to, I'd say go for it regardless of the company you find yourself. And you just might be creating something new. Um, when I joined Unilever, um, my boss had said to me, look, uh, some people have this idea they are working on. And honestly, I don't know much about it. Do you want to take it on? It was in nutrition, you know, we had fortified our cubes and we now needed to design a, uh, a behavior change program for young girls and women to, to understand about iron deficiency anemia and to, to prevent it. And I said, oh yes, I'd love to do that. And she told me, if you do that, I need to tell you, I don't know much about it. You're on your own on this. You see what I mean? And I mean, I was glad to do it. I did it. It was a remarkable program. We exported it to Kenya and to Southeast Asia. And, and you know, everybody was calling me within the business to come contribute ideas to the other programs they're doing. But it might as well have failed. But it was really about me. I could have said, oh, if my boss doesn't know about this, who am I? I shouldn't be doing this or, you know, something like that. So I think to a large extent, it's less about the company and more about you. And if you find that the company just doesn't get it and will not let you proceed with it, regardless of what you do, maybe it's time to take your business and come to maybe Nutrivida or Unilever. I'm sure we'll be glad to have you. <laughs> Lisa, if I can add 20 seconds, I will say maybe companies don't have a purpose defined, but they have a mission and a vision. And you have to be related to that. You have to feel connected to that mission or that higher purpose. And, and that can lead to a really good opportunity as Godwin said. That's true. Thank you both so very much for your wonderful insights, for the very interesting stories shared, for the great work you're doing. We admire you for this and we're very, very happy and honored to be working with the two of you in Unusual Pioneers and beyond. And we're looking forward to seeing what will the future bring for all of us. Now being respectful of the one minute we have left in this session, I unfortunately need to close the Q&A round here. Um, but please do feel free to approach me at any time and I will be happy to connect you with Gisela and Godwin if you have a specific question to the two of them. Um, I did see a few specific questions on the chat. Feel free to post them now. I will now share my email address with everyone um, so you can send those questions um, towards me. Thank you, dear audience. Thank you, everyone, for listening in to our talk about social entrepreneurship. A very special thank you to our two guests, Gisela and Godwin, for joining us today. And thank you to the organizers of this wonderful event of the Global Social Business Summit um, for inviting us. Thank you to the Grameen Creative Lab, to the UNIS Center team. If you are a corporate entrepreneur and are listening in here today and you want to learn more about the work done in Unusual Pioneers or connect with some of our entrepreneurs, feel free to reach out at any point of time. 
Thank you very much and have a happy Sunday. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for facilitating the session today. And thank you, Gisela and Godwin, for pioneering your movement for such an intriguing session. And it is truly admirable. With this, we call to close our panel discussions for today. Um, but it is now my pleasure to introduce some of the workshops that are currently happening and are scheduled for later. The first, uh, the first workshop is the Kofi Annan Award for Innovation in Africa, How to Apply. This workshop is organized by Kofi Annan Award. The Kofi Annan Award is a Pan-African call for digital innovations in health and well-being with available grants up to 250,000 euros, a boot camp, mentors, and high international visibility to support African on, uh, entrepreneurs. Um, this workshop is already ongoing, but you might still have some time to join in. We, I believe we still have 14 minutes of it left. Um, please follow the links provided in the chat box. Please remember that these workshops are happening on the Hubelo platform. To those who have registered, you may um, you know, check the workshop tab, click on the workshop tab to enter the workshop of your choice. But if you have not registered, please do so. The link for registration is also available in the chat box. The second workshop scheduled for East African time 7.30, Tata time 10.30 and Central European time 5.30 um, is on making fashion sustainable with systems thinking. Join the session if you wish to understand how you can, uh, you know, how, how can systems thinking help analyze and solve problems and to learn from slow fashion in social business. Again, uh, you will find the joining link, uh, links in the chat box. Please register if you have not uh, to join the session. Tomorrow, we have some more interesting workshops. The third workshop organized by Asian Institute of Technology on exploring the business model Canva as a social business design followed by another workshop on leadership skills to social business entrepreneurs, also organized by the Asian Institute of Technology. Uh, thank you all for joining. You may now find, uh, please click on the link to find a session or a workshop of your choice. And I will also see you again tomorrow for the next panels and workshops.